Wow, has it been a whole year already? I wasn't sure I'd stick with my YouTube channel this long, but I'm glad I did. It's been fun to just sit down, revisit old games, write a script, and create a video about it. I may not have a giant audience, but I don't really care. The whole point was to get my thoughts out there and discuss games I really like. That said, thank you to those who have followed my channel and watched my videos. If you're new, like, comment, subscribe, you know the drill. So let's dive into this first anniversary celebration with the sequel to the first game I covered, Mega Man Legends 2. I'm going to briefly sum up the first game before talking about what's new in this one. The first game opens up with Mega Man Ballnut, his childhood friend Roll Casket, and her grandfather Barrel crash landing on Catalox Island. After meeting the locals, the island comes under attack from Sky Pirates, the Bond family, led by the trio of siblings of Tron, Bon, and Teasel. Mega Man faces off against them as they race to find the legendary treasure, the Motherload, supposedly buried somewhere on the island. Towards the end of the game, it turns out it's not the legendary treasure, but a being known as Juno. Juno reveals that Mega Man is something called a purifier unit, and that his true name is Mega Man Trigger. He doesn't reveal much, and traps our hero before going on to activate Eden, a satellite weapon he plans to use to purge Catalox Island of carbons, or the human population. The Bonds free Mega Man and the Blue Bomber defeats Juno, saving the day but opening up a whole lot of questions about his origins. The first thing that'll be obvious to anyone jumping right in from the first game is that Mega Man's voice actor has been recast. In this game he's now voiced by Susan Roman, who voiced the mayor of Catalox Island, Amelia. To those who grew up in the 90s era, you'll also recognize her as the voice of Sailor Jupiter in the deke dub of Sailor Moon. I couldn't find an explanation for the recast, but Mega Man's original VA, Corey Sevier, was pretty young when the first game came out. So my assumption is he was recast when he hit puberty and his voice changed. Gameplay in the sequel remains the same as the first game, but with a few differences. For example, you now have an aiming reticle when locking onto an enemy. It changes from yellow to red depending on whether an enemy is in shooting range or not. However, like the first game, it does have an annoying habit of snapping onto random enemies while aiming. Your special weapons also changed, using two energy bars, green and blue. Green works like a stamina bar, while blue counts as the actual energy for the weapon, meaning you can only spam a weapon's attack so much before you have to wait for it to recharge. This brings some balance to the more powerful weapons as it stops you from spamming attacks and destroying everything in an instant. You can still upgrade them to mitigate this issue though. Speaking of weapons, when in ruins, you trade out your ability to kick for a new item called the Lifter. In the first game, the kick didn't have much use inside ruins, but the Lifter on the other hand gets some decent use to solve some puzzles. You can pick up and lift blocks to use on switches, throw certain reaver bots, and throw attacks back at enemies. You can even use it to pick up girls. New to this game are status elements. In certain areas in Ruins and certain Reaver bots now have attacks that can give Mega Man a status effect. Paralysis, which will cut down his movement speed to a crawl. Burn, which covers him in flames and decreases his health over time. Energy Leak, which disables your buster and drains all of your weapon energy. Easily the worst one. And the last one I think is meant to be a cold effect, as it's a blue flame with the same effect as Burn, but only showing up in an ice area. When affected, you'll either have to wait for the status to go away on its own, cure it with your medicine bottle, or use a specific barrier you can buy to protect against it. Graphics remain the same, and I also want to take this moment to correct myself from the first video. I referred to the art style as cell shaded which it isn't. I couldn't figure out what to call it back then, so I just settled on cell shaded due to the toony look. In actuality, it's more like 3D pixel art, so my bad on that one guys. The game still looks gorgeous though, even more so upscaled to HD, using textures to give characters a varying range of expressions, along with different areas having their own unique look and feel. Also something I noticed while playing is the game has a lot more unique NPCs compared to the first. Part of that reason being is that we now have more islands to visit. Controlling the flutter on the map, you can visit a snow-covered continent, a tropical island, a Sahara-like desert, and more. Like the first game, you'll be exploring ruins for items in Zenny, but things are a little different when it comes to your digger rank now. In the first game, your rank worked as a level gate, preventing you from going into certain ruins and optional ruins till the plot let you. It still does that here, but in a different way. 
Now your digger rank acts as a difficulty level. First, you'll have to take a test with the Diggers Guild. The test is an obstacle course that will have you clear out Reaver bots in a small dungeon within a time limit. When you increase your digger rank, the Reaver bots you fight have more health, but they'll also drop more Zenny. And once you go up in rank, you can't go down, so you may want to wait before taking the Diggers test. Two last things I want to cover before going into the game's story is Noriety and Affection. It doesn't have an official name as far as I know, but both games have a sorta karma meter for Mega Man. When he does bad things such as kicking the can into the bakery in the first game, or abusing animals in this game, his Noriety will go down. The more he does these things, the darker his armor gets until he's considered dark or evil. <laughs> In the first game, it didn't amount to much outside of people talking bad about you, but in this game, you can buy items from certain NPCs only if you're bad. On the opposite end, you can now become Light Mega Man too. A lighter shade achieved by doing good things, which will net you discounts at the junk shops. Now affection is essentially your relationship with Roll. In the first game, you could find random items that you could give to Roll to raise your relationship with her. But it didn't amount to much outside of her diary entries revealing her feelings for Mega Man. Here, if you buy her gifts, things for the Flutter, and fix the Flutter after it gets damaged in the prologue, Roll can improve your weapons at a discounted rate. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into the story. The game takes place about a year after the events of the first game, and opens up with an insanely long cutscene. Seriously, it's like a solid 10 minutes before the title screen. It opens with Beryl speaking to his old friend Werner von Blucher. Riding on Blucher's massive airship, the Sulphur Bottom. The pair have called a press conference, declaring their desire to return to Forbidden Island, a place they visited 30 years ago and no other digger has been able to reach. Beryl has reservations about returning, especially after his daughter Matilda and her husband Banner disappeared trying to go there, leaving Roll in his care. At the press conference, Blucher fields some questions and explains that he believes the mother load is most likely on Forbidden Island. Scanning through the crowd of reporters, we'll notice a familiar group of people hiding amongst them. The Sky Pirates Tron, Teasel, Glide, and newcomer Claymore all eager to take the mother load for themselves. Also, it turns out the Bonds tried to go straight after the events of the first game, but Teasel's shitty business skills have left their store in the red. After more questions, Blucher calls in a suspicious blonde reporter who immediately presses the two, questioning if the mother load really is the great treasure everyone thinks it is. As Beryl tries to answer, he stops mid-sentence, recognizing the reporter as his missing daughter Matilda. And holy shit, Roll's mom is a MILF. MILF! 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 Before he can ask her what's going on, another reporter interrupts saying Matilda tied her up and stole her credentials. Blucher instructs his guard to keep their weapons on her, and Matilda warns that the mother load is actually a great catastrophe and not some amazing treasure, before jumping off the ship and being carried away by a flying silver reaver bot. On the flutter, Mega Man and Roll watch the press conference as it takes place. Roll caught off guard after seeing what her mother just did and said, and questioning if that's really her. Mega Man, wearing an apron and confirming that his blue armor really is just armor and not his real body, says that they should confirm what happened and head for the sulfur bottom taking us to the title screen and finally starting the game. Starting the game properly, Mega Man is trying his best to steer the ship while Roll works on their new engine, Data pestering him while he steers. Roll soon joins him and takes over, asking Data to have some lunch ready for them. Unfortunately for her, monkeys are incapable of using ovens, as he ends up starting a huge fire that kicks off the tutorial level. Welcome to Fireman Simulator, Mega Man Edition. He'll have to use the Aqua Blaster in order to put out the fires on the ship. It serves to show the player how to use the lock-on and special weapons, as well as the new stamina system for special weapons. Put out the fires, save data, and learn a valuable lesson about asking monkeys to cook pizza. Going back to the Sulphur Bottom, Blucher is prepping to breach the heavy storm covering Forbidden Island, the Bonds acting as his exclusive reporters to witness the event. However, Matilda and the silver reaver bot she's riding on are intent on stopping them. Shooting up the ship before being scared away, the large airship is forced to make an emergency landing on the island. The flutter catches up just as they're shot down, unable to penetrate the clouds to follow. Mega Man and Roll decide to land on the nearby town of Yasyanki City to find a way to enter Forbidden Island. Man, I love this area. I'm a sucker for winter-themed levels in video games. 
and dig the Christmas theme music that plays while you're here. You could tell the devs felt the first game was just way too similar, and wanted to hit you with a different biome right away so you felt like the game was new. Landing on the island, Roll explains that they may have a way to land on Forbidden Island, showing Mega Man the blueprints to a dropship her father designed. Entering the city, they approach the local junk shop, hoping to find the right parts to build the dropship. Inside, the owner is talking with this shifty looking dude with a robot arm named Joe. Joe is planning to explore the local ruins, the owner trying to talk him out of it and reminding him that he has a family. As he leaves, Roll feels like she knows him from somewhere. Talking to the owner and showing him the dropship plans, he explains that Joe has the same schematics in his lab. Wow, that's pretty sus. Maybe he knows something about Roll's dad. Time to go grill him. Heading to Joe's lab, we find out he's already done most of the work in building his own dropship. Looking around, he isn't here though, and a little girl interrupts to tell them that Joe is at the nearby ruins. Roll asks her if she knows anyone by the name Casket being here, but she says it's just Joe. If you take the time to talk to the locals before heading to the ruins, you'll find out Joe has amnesia, and was found by the bar owner Maria, the little girl's mother. Huh, a man with amnesia that has the blueprints her father made? What could this mean, I wonder? Also, while we're on the subject of the town, I love all the shoutouts to the older Mega Man media here while we're exploring. In the bar, you'll see a cartoon based on the original series, briefly showing the classic Mega Man and Proto Man. In the general goods store, you'll spot a comic with Kalinka, Dr. Kosak's daughter from Mega Man 3 on it, with the island's name and obvious reference to her too. You can also spot a poster for Zero on the back wall. Outside of town, the pair will follow some train tracks leading them to the ruins. The music out here is really beautiful, and it honestly feels more like it suits an endgame area than some random snow level. I also dig how it picks up in intensity when you engage in combat. Roll will tag along on the way to the ruins, but you don't actually have to protect her as she doesn't have a health bar. But you can be mean and bully her if you want. Once inside, you'll eventually find Joe slumped over in a chamber next to a refractor. He's been hurt badly by the boss Reaver bot in here, and passes out, asking Mega Man to take care of it just in case it decides to attack the town. Mega Man complies, and we enter the first boss battle against a towering behemoth whose long arms give it some serious reach. How are we going to stop this powerful boss? Yep, the good old circle strafe method is back in effect. Just lock on, circle around him, and shoot. You can also make this guy even easier by shooting the weak point on his back. Destroy him, grab the refractor, and get Joe to the hospital. There, he explains the blueprints to the dropship are the only thing tying him to his old life. He built it hoping to get to Forbidden Island and regain his memories. Roll asks him if he knows someone named Casket, or if she looks familiar to him. Unfortunately, he can't remember, and passes out, telling the pair they can use the refractor they found to power the dropship and head to the island themselves. Before heading off to the island, now's a good time to upgrade your digger rank from B to A. Like I brought up before, the first test isn't very difficult, and while enemies will get tougher, the extra zenny drops will speed up buying new armor and upgrading your weapons. Talk to Roll on the flutter, and she'll launch the dropship onto the island. Are you ready, Mega Man? Yep. Okay, here we go. Hold hatch open. Releasing docking clamp. Drop ship away! Forbidden Island is covered in debris from previous airships who tried and failed to make it to the island. There's a constant snowstorm raging as Mega Man explores the island, finding people frozen in ice and running into Reaverbots hidden in the snow. Halfway through, you'll be locked into a short fight against a wolf-like Reaverbot. Despite the scene hyping it up, it's a very easy fight. Just keep locked on and circle strafe. Further in, you'll run into elephant-like Reaverbots that will hide in snowbanks and charge at you. At the end of the area, you'll find this huge floating crystal in the middle of a large snow pile. Approaching it, you'll activate a giant version of the elephant Reaverbot from before. Cue another boss fight. It will attack by firing snow, jumping up in the air to create a shockwave, and firing a large red energy ball. The usual strategy applies, though because of the Reaverbot's size, you'll need to get some distance from it or risk getting hit just running around. Once you destroy it, the endless storm will finally end and the diamond in the center will open up. 
Inside are two beings, a tall man carrying a naked young girl, who kinda reminds me of Rei Ayanami. What follows is another long cutscene with a lot of exposition. The beings inside the diamond are Geats and his mistress Sarah. Watching from the sidelines is Matilda and a similar looking man to Geats named Gats, also holding a girl in his arms. Gats calls Matilda Mistress Yuna and says she has no choice but to give the keys to Sarah now. Matilda disagrees and changes the subject to Mega Man instead, wondering why someone called the Master would leave his genetic code with Mega Man. She also brings up what Juno said in the first game, that Mega Man is a purifier unit. His job was to hunt down aberrant units, but he ultimately became the biggest aberrant himself. Like I brought up in that video, this sounds a lot like the Maverick Hunters of the Mega Man X series. Finishing their chat, Gats turns into the Silver Reaver bot we saw earlier and carries Matilda and the unconscious girl away. Back on the Silver Bottom, Geats and Sarah meet with Blucher and Barrel. Through his stiff voice acting, Geats explains he needs their help in finding the four keys to the Motherlode in order to save Mistress Sarah. In exchange, he promises to give them ancient technology that will let them make an infinite amount of refractors. The men agree, but it's obvious they're a bit skeptical as well. Blucher allowing the pair to stay on his ship, but with armed guards watching them. After the cutscene, Blucher will ask for Mega Man's help in finding the keys, sending him to Pakte Village on Manda Island. Arriving on the outskirts of the village, you'll spot some servbots wandering around. No doubt the Bonds are already here looking for the key themselves. Before the village, you can go into the nearby sub-ruins instead. It's an easy area and has a boss fight against the Reaverbot from the Kalinka Mine. You'll end up collecting a refractor for your trouble and unlike the first game, can sell it for some decent cash. It's worth running through as the extra Zenian items help a lot towards upgrades and making the next fight easier. And chances are you're going to run through this area a lot in the future to grind Zenny. Inside here is a large golden bird-like Reaverbot called King Mirok. It's an easy kill and drops around 8 to 15,000 Zenny depending on your digger rank. What's great about this enemy is if you leave the room and return, it will instantly respawn letting you farm it over and over for fast zenny. The only downside is this subroom will randomize through three different versions when you first enter it, so it may take a few tries till you get the one with King Mirok. Entering the village, you'll be confronted by Tron in a crab-like mech. Before fighting, she tries to trick Mega Man into switching sides, telling him that Roll doesn't like him, won't date him, and steals some of the money used for weapon development. This entire scene is hilarious, with Tron's crush on Mega Man more obvious than ever. He's close to believing her, and Tron ups the ante by changing her voice to Rolls to sell the lie better. Despite her antics though, she still engages in a boss fight. Like the first game, her mech can destroy the town around her, but it's close to impossible to protect the buildings as Tron's long range attacks combined with her maneuverability means she's going to end up destroying most of the buildings by the time the fight's over. Circle Strafe won't win you the fight as easily either. Her spinning machine gun attack seems designed to counter this strategy as it's difficult to dodge the attack as there are just too many bullets going in each direction to avoid consistently. On top of that, she'll try to land on Mega Man, start spinning all over the arena to hit him, meanwhile still pretending to be Roll and giving him fake hints. After the fight, Roll manages to get through to Mega Man, the dumb kid wising up that Tron was tricking him the entire time. I can't help but feel bad for Tron here though, she's audibly upset as she hears the two talking and obviously wants Mega Man to join sides with her. Her servbots try to cheer her up a bit before she leaves the scene. Re-enter the village and the villagers will come out of hiding, thanking Mega Man for his help. Like the first game, you can donate to repair their damaged homes and businesses, and it's a lot cheaper than the first game. With the town rebuilt, I recommend buying the light ship from the junk shop and taking it to roll for the next ruin. Now head for the schoolhouse. In here, you'll meet the town's mayor who... Wow, I don't remember her being this hot. She thanks you for dealing with the pirates and offers you the chance to win a prize by taking her quiz. It's 10 questions and isn't timed, but holy hell. How was any kid supposed to answer these back in the year 2000? Like you'd think the devs would ask things about the Mega Man universe or stuff you can find out in the game, but nope. The questions vary from stuff like Madonna's first album to questions about the periodic elements, plants, and US history. This stuff is easy to figure out now with a Google search, but there's no way a kid figured this out at the turn of the millennium. Was there an official Mega Man Legends 2 Brady Games strategy guide they had to buy with this game? If you finish the quiz, she'll offer to give you a special item, the Zet Saber, if you can beat her 100 question quiz, or pay 2 million zenny. Let's just head for the ruins for now. When you enter, you'll trigger a cutscene where the Sky Pirate Claymore shows up. He's talking to his partner Bola, who's less than enthusiastic at the idea of finding the Motherlode, already having so much money he could live the good life and quit being a pirate. 
Claymore talks him into helping, though, tempting him with the chance to fight Mega Man. The Manda ruins give off this lost Aztec temple vibe, with lots of foliage growing around it and filled with frog, snake, and bug reaver bots. Explore deep enough and you'll encounter Bola. He's rather polite and nice to Mega Man and says he's sorry about trying to fight, but owes it to Claymore since he wants the motherload. Cue a boss battle. He'll start by poofing away and summoning some frog reaver bots. Once they're gone, he'll reappear and throw knives at Mega Man. And that's it. You know the routine already. Just lock on, shoot, and run around him till you finish the fight. He praises Mega Man's skills but tells him he'll be back once he's got his second win. Moving ahead, you'll eventually find a switch to unlock a door back near the entrance. And proceeding through this area, you'll find a blue key card in order to unlock the next door. Q Bola returning. He's tougher this time, dropping some spinning metal tops in the tiny room, shrinking where you can move, and crippling the go to circle strafe maneuver. He'll use the same attack as before by throwing knives at you, but will occasionally jump on top of the center top and control the other ones in the room to try and crush you. He's still easy. You just have to jump often and attack while standing still to avoid running into the tops. After losing again, Bola will lecture you about not wasting your youth before dipping out. Returning to the entrance, you can activate the blue stone in the middle, lifting a bridge to cross the second floor. This has the added side effect of activating more reaver bots, turning on traps, and turning on the electricity in certain areas. Remember when I said to buy the light chip? If you took it to roll, she'll develop it into the hover shoes, allowing you to safely walk across electrified areas. Clear out the rest of the ruins and make it to the room holding the key. Unfortunately, Bola already beat you to it, but his dumbass let it get eaten by the boss reaver bot here. He lets you have the key if you can manage to beat the boss. Right on cue, the boss will drop in, being a bigger variation of the frog reaver bots you fought before. Again, this fight feels like the developers took notes about how easy it was to cheese everything by circle strafing. The boss will leap between four raised pillars on an arena, the outside of which has metal tops spinning back and forth like in the Bola fight. At the bottom of the arena are these little leech things, making it impossible to aim properly at the boss while you're down here. When engaging the boss, it's only vulnerable when it opens its mouth to attack, firing bubbles and attacking with its tongue, also becoming vulnerable when it leaps at you and rolls onto its back. To add even more onto it, a bug reaver bot will occasionally fly in that the boss can eat to regain health, so you'll want to kill it when it shows up. Once he's destroyed, you'll get the first key to the mother load, and get instantly taken out of the Manda ruins, head back to the flutter and fly to the sulfur bottom to turn in the key, and receive your next location, Nino Island. Nino Island is the HQ of the Diggers Guild, and like the last island, is under attack by the Pirate Alliance, specifically Glide and his bird bots. Unfortunately, the island is very trigger happy from constant attacks and mistakes the Flutter for another pirate ship, shooting our heroes down. They survive and the flustered Guildmaster rushes in to apologize, asking them to stay and explore the guild. Good thing we have plot armor, otherwise this would be super awkward for him to explain later. In terms of design, Nino Island feels kind of like an oil platform out at sea. The Diggers Guild haven't built a small settlement on top of the ruins here. There isn't much of interest outside of another junk shop, general store, and the Digger Guild itself. Like Kalinka, you can take the Diggers test here, but it also has its own little sub-ruins that you can run multiple times to grind Zenny if you needed. Talk to the Guildmaster and he'll apologize for almost killing you, explaining they sealed the ruins off as a precaution while dealing with Glide. Right on cue, his bird bots swoop in for another attack on the island. The Guildmaster begs for your help, but refreshingly, unlike Catalox Island's incompetent police department, the diggers here actually fight back and help Mega Man. If you fail though, instead of just a game over, the Guildmaster decides to blow up the whole island to protect the ruins, killing everyone. Alright, I think that's a bit much, don't you think? You have civilians living on your island, dude. In the first section, Johnny, the Guildmaster's assistant, along with some diggers, will fire on the robots dropping bird bots trying to breach the gate. It plays like the Bon Bon mission from the first game, having to take out flying mechs to stop the onslaught of bird bots. After enough time, the guild will have fixed their main gun for this deck, needing you to pull a lever to bring it in and push back the bird bots. Do the same thing on the other deck, at the dock where the flutter is located, and finally on the roof of the base. Having driven them off, the Guildmaster will ask you to take the fight to their door, sending you to Glide's base on Calvania Island. On the island, you'll be approached by twin boys named Apo and Da. The Glide gang have captured their older sister Shu, and need your help in saving her. Glide's fortress is heavily armed, so it won't be easy getting inside. The twins will show you a way above the wall, needing you to guard them as they run through the war zone. 
Thankfully, it's not an escort mission. You just need to help them up if they fall, or just destroy all the weapons around them to get them to the entrance. Once in the clear, the boys will throw Mega Man over the wall. Inside, Shu runs to the window asking for help before a bird bot carries her away and sounds the alarm. You'll have to fight your way through the fortress, destroying the airships, tanks, and turrets along the way. As you clean out an area, the boss bird bot will drop a key letting you unlock the next area and move on. Towards the end, you'll eventually reach Shu and rescue her, but you're now on a timer as the base is set to explode in 120 seconds. This last part is brutal if only from the sheer amount of enemies attacking you, as well as the wonkiness of the lock-on making it hard to hit the bigger enemies. Clear the gate, carry Shu through it, and run away as the base explodes behind you. Back home, the brothers will thank you for your help, and Shu will give you a cute piggy as a reward. Disappointingly, you can't turn it into some kind of pig gun. If you're a class A digger, you can take on the sub ruins here on the island for some zenny and items. Otherwise, everything's wrapped up and you can head back to the guildmaster. However, Glide is far from finished, bringing out his flagship to try and destroy the Diggers Guild once and for all. Before the Guildmaster can blow himself up, Roll suggests fixing their best weapon in order to deal with Glide. Why they never routinely ran maintenance on their best weapon to protect themselves until now is beyond me, but whatever. Climbing up to the roof with Roll, you'll have to protect her while Glide fires a non-stop barrage of missiles. Once she's done, she'll fire the weapon at them, but instead of a giant laser beam, it's a sound attack? Well, it still works. <laughs> wait, wait, stop! What are you doing? If you keep that up, you'll... <laughs> Once that mess is all done, you can finally enter the ruins to search for the second key. Before going in though, I recommend buying the Aqua Chip and having Roll develop the Hydro Jets to move around down below. Also, you can give this lonely girl the piggy shoe gave you. You don't get anything for it, but it's a nice thing to do. Now dive into that huge hole in the ground and enter the ruins. The Nino Ruins is an underwater themed level, and in the tradition of all water themed levels, it's absolutely terrible. It starts off like a normal ruin, letting you run around, fight reaver bots, and has some really good music playing. The problems start with the actual mechanics of this ruin. There are several areas where you need to lift these large blocks in order to jump and reach out of the way areas, but the only way to do that is to flood the area with water, making the blocks light enough for Mega Man to lift. This comes with a massive amount of problems, as Mega Man slows down to a crawl while underwater. This is where the Hydro Jets come in, as they'll let you skate around in water like the regular Hover Jets on land. But the water doesn't slow down Reaver Bots at all, so fighting them can be an absolute chore. On top of that, the different floors all look the same, so it's easy to get turned around and lost even with the map. And finally, some areas need you to go the long way around to proceed, dragging things out even more. Halfway through the ruin, you'll get into a boss fight against three Jellyfish Reaver Bots. This fight is insanely long if you don't turn off the water for the area, as the Reaver Bots will move around the area firing attacks and paralyze you when slamming into you. And finally, they're immune to attacks unless they are attacking. Fighting them without the water lets you move at normal speed, and they end up stationary instead, making them much easier targets, but still pretty annoying. Deeper into the ruins, you'll find a wide open area with a Manta Ray-like Reaver Bot floating around. It's not hostile, and you'll need to hop on top of it and ride around to jump and find a key to the next door in a chest. It's another frustrating puzzle, as while there isn't anything complicated about it, it can be tough landing your floaty jumps, and then you have to wait for him to slowly make his way to the pillar so you can get the key. Finally, you can scoop the second key and get out of here, but not so fast. Claymore's here to stop you. He's completely stationary during his fight, firing energy balls at you and trying to hit you with his machine gun. Circle Strafe is tough to pull off, mainly because of the way he leads his shots, as it's very easy to get hit while circling around him. Once you beat him, like Bola, he'll praise your abilities before warning he'll be back. Unfortunately, despite grabbing the key, you won't be instantly transported out of the ruin. You'll have to make your way all the way back to the entrance. But thankfully, all the water is drained, so you don't have to struggle in slowness. Once you reach the entrance, Claymore is back for round two. The fight is mostly the same. This time though, he'll fire floating mines, a homing attack, and a full room laser attack. Circle around him, jump often, and hopefully have some energy in your canteen if you get hurt badly. Beaten again, Claymore doesn't want to give up, but he has to when his back gives out on him. 
Bola shows up to get him out of there, apologizing to Mega Man and letting him keep the key. And with that, the nightmare of this dungeon is finally over. Oh my god, I think it's easily worse than the Water Temple of Ocarina of Time. Reporting back to the Sulphur Bottom to turn in the key, Blucher points you to Salkata Island for the third key, and like the last two islands, the Pirate Alliance is already attacking the nearby Kimotama City. Arriving on the outskirts of the island, you'll have to navigate through a desert to make it to the city. You also have the chance to visit the sub ruins here, but only if you took the S-Class Diggers exam, which is insanely frustrating to complete. And the sub ruins themselves are also underwater like the last place, so I'd save it for later. Reaching the city, it's now your mission to free the people and get rid of the bonds. It plays a lot like the raid on Glide's Fortress, needing to clear the area of the bonds forces, finding a key, and moving on to the next area. Once you make it to the ruins entrance, Teasel will be there doing a stock check of everything they stole from the people here. Though he is nice enough to leave them their toilet paper at least. Confronting him, he has an ace up his sleeve, holding the sacred gold statue of the city hostage before engaging in a boss battle. The entire area is covered in sand, slowing down your movements and making you an easy target for Teasel's attacks. You'll have to climb up on one of the raised pillars in order to move comfortably and hit him. Problem is, Teasel will use the statue as a shield in between attacks, so you risk destroying it and having to cough up to repair it. On top of that, Servbots will be drilling out of the sand and attacking you the whole time. You'll have to take the fight slow, hitting Teasel, waiting for him to move the statue out of the way, and taking cover to dodge his attacks. With him defeated, he'll fly off, leaving Tron and Bond to handle things inside the ruins. If you manage not to destroy the statue, the mayor will thank you and give you access to a racing minigame you can play to win Zenny. Roll will also park the flutter closer to the ruins now, letting you heal up and improve your weapons before entering to confront the bonds. The Salkata ruins are more straightforward and less stressful compared to the last one. The door leading to the key is right on the first floor, however you'll have to take care of a few things before you can enter, mainly dealing with the huge reaver bot inside the main chamber. At the moment it's completely invincible and immune to all damage, so you'll have to figure out a way to power it down. Also one thing I want to complain about in here is this stupid reaver bot that spawns on the ground and traps you. It'll show up at random points in the ruins and has no tell or sign on how to avoid it. You'll just have to hug the walls of most hallways in order to avoid it. Exploring the ruins, you'll eventually bump into Tron and Bon, the pair having figured out a way to power down the reaver bot. Its power comes from the lava pumping into its room, so Tron thinks that by knocking down this large rock to plug the lava flow, it'll become vulnerable. The three of them form a truce, Mega Man assisting them in taking out the rock by picking up the little reaver bots in the room and tossing them at the rock. Once it's knocked down, you can challenge the boss properly. It's a real joke of a fight. Its huge size makes it too slow, barely moving at all and all of his attacks are very easy to read. Just unload everything you got into him and he'll go down in seconds. Taken care of, he'll drop the key to the first floor door, allowing you to move on to search for the mother load key. Once you get there, Bond beats you to it, the little, okay, big baby, snatching it away, needing you to chase after him. Not so fast though, as Tron won't let you catch her little brother, confronting you in the Gustav. It's another easy fight, especially if you've upgraded your buster. Tron will charge you while holding up a shield, but will drop it when firing back. From there, just unload on her and you'll finish her in seconds. You'll kick her ass so bad that the resulting explosion ends up destroying her clothes. <coughs> well, <coughs> there goes another go <coughs> Gustav! <coughs> but it doesn't matter! You're too late! We won! Bob is on his way back to the surface with the key! <coughs> What? Why is your face red? Why is everyone looking at me that way? Um, Miss Tron, your uh, clothes have been um, uh, kind of um, ripped off. Actually, your clothes are um, gone. What? Huh? Ah! Ah! You, you dummies! Why didn't you tell me before? Retreat! Retreat! Roger! Roger. After our Mega Boy becomes a Mega Man, Roll snaps him back to reality and reminds him that Bond still has the key and is running out of the ruins. Chasing after him, you'll have to take him out before he escapes, which like Tron is insanely easy. Dropping him in seconds and watching the poor little guy sink into lava. Gee, I hope he's okay. Mega Man, baby murderer. Big old yikes. Scoop up the third key and return to the sulfur bottom. The location of the last key is right where we started, back on Kalinka, beneath the church in the city. And not surprisingly, the Pirate Alliance haven't given up, all of them teaming up to take out the city. 
Back in the city, you'll find Roll next to a train that looks suspiciously like the support car from the first game. Heading to the hospital, it turns out Joe was the one who built it, wanting to use it to fight off the pirates but tiring himself out. He hands you the key and asks for your help, telling you about a dream he had about his old family and how happy he used to be. When you leave the room, he remembers his attempt to go to Forbidden Island, confident that Mega Man will be able to get Roll there, before dropping the same picture of Roll's parents that Beryl had at the beginning of the game. If it wasn't 100% obvious by now, the Amnesiac Joe is in fact Roll's father, Banner. And the game does nothing with this. There isn't a heartfelt reunion with his daughter. Hell, Roll doesn't even put two and two together herself that Joe is in fact her dad. If you come back later, Joe has left with Maria and her daughter to start a new life for themselves. Which feels so weird. I get it's not exactly easy to abandon the new life he started while he had no memories, but at the very least he could have talked to Roll or left her a message. He doesn't even mention Matilda at all. He may not even know she's actually still alive. Maybe they would have done something with it in Legends 3, but somehow I doubt that. Return to Roll and the two of you can go after the pirates on the train. The Pirate Alliance have weaponized the train using the remaining machines from the Bonds and Glide. However, the Alliance has begun to dissolve, with Bola dipping out, tired of the entire mess, and Claymore following suit. This leaves the Bonds and Glides as the only ones left to fight against. Fighting from on top of the train, you'll have to deal with Glide's compartment first. He'll shoot multiple bombs at your train and you won't be able to hit them back until the train gets closer to him. After taking out his big gun, he'll switch to machine gun fire and a laser beam that is constantly moving from side to side. Unlike the last few bosses, the Glide train car soaks up a ton of damage and because of the multiple weapons on his rig, it screws up the aiming of the auto lock on. Defeating Glide, the Bonds cut their losses and disconnect his car as it blows up. On to part 2, the Bond Train. Without Glide slowing them down, the train gets a decent lead ahead of Mega Man. Now out of range of his attacks, the Bonds will start firing missiles with the Servbots steering it towards them, and that's going to be your main way of fighting back, grabbing their missiles with the lifter and throwing them right back. When you do enough damage returning the missiles, you'll catch up to them and can damage the main car. Like before, the lock-on gets in the way, and it's better to just manually aim and shoot to destroy the car. On their last sliver of health, the train is cut down to just Bon Bon driving it. Hey, I guess he didn't die after all. Yay! Anyways, shoot him up and beat the Bonds. With the Pirate Alliance taken care of, you can now enter the ruins beneath the church. But why not take a load off on the flutter first? Huh, that's weird. I wonder where Roll is. Let me just check the bathroom here. Hey! What do you think you're doing? Oops. Accidentally seeing two girls naked in one day? Careful, Mega Man, you might get cancelled on social media. By the way, this scene is your cue that you've reached max affection with Roll and can now get upgrades at a 10% discount. I guess peeping on girls has its perks. Talk to the priest and descend into the Kalinka ruins, and appropriately for a wintertime island, this dungeon is ice themed. And just as predictably, it comes with annoying ice physics. Unless of course you bought the spike chip and developed it into cleated shoes, which I did not for some reason. This actually did make things a bit more difficult for me as there are several places where you need to make precise jumps onto platforms and I ended up slipping off a lot. The gimmick for this stage is turning off these red and blue barriers so that you can descend down into the ruin faster, requiring some backtracking here and there. When you make it to the bottom level, you'll be in a room with red variants of the Elephant Reaver bots. They're completely invincible and instead work more as a puzzle, having to lure them into these pits in the room to unlock the doors around you. Easier said than done though, especially if you didn't have the cleated shoes. The elephants won't blindly jump in and will stop themselves before falling in. You'll have to stand right on the edge of a hole, wait for one to charge you, and jump out of the way at the last second. If you fail, you'll land in the hole yourself and get covered in blue fire. Once the doors are open, you can descend to the final floor below. But the key to the last door is made up of three tiny reaver bots you have to chase down and pick up to reform the key. Get through the last door, scoop up the last key, and fight one more reaver bot. This time, a giant slime. It's a bit unnerving to look at, the boss slowly chasing after you and expanding in size to attack you. During certain attacks, it'll become immune to damage, summoning platforms above it. You'll have to jump up there fast or else get hit with the blue fire debuff again. On the platforms, you'll need to circle around and avoid the pieces of itself that it throws at you. After enough time, the platforms disappear and the floor is safe again. Do enough damage and he'll dissolve into nothing, letting you leave the ruins and turn in the final key. Return to the Sulphur Bottom, and right on cue, Sarah and Geats instantly betray you, sabotaging the ship. Her plan is to initiate the Carbon Reinitialization Program, 
essentially the same plan Juno had, but killing all the carbons on Terra instead of just one island. The ship starts shaking with explosions going off everywhere, the bonds watching the whole thing happen from their ship. The scene then fades to black. When Mega Man wakes up, he finds Matilda, aka Yuna, beside him, holding the same girl from earlier, which, as it turns out, is Yuna's original body. She has a chat with Sarah and Geet, trying to reason with the both of them to stop what they're doing and to leave the Master's genetic code with Mega Man. Sarah refuses and leaves with the keys, having Geet stay behind to retrieve the sample. Matilda has Gats sever Geet's control of the ship and tells Mega Man to get on the roof and fight him. Are you malfunctioning, Gats? There's no need for us to fight. Why do you insist on opposing me? Sorry, Geets, but I don't believe what Mistress Sarah is planning is right. Mistress Yuna is also in error, abandoning her shell for a carbons. That is no longer Mistress Yuna. It's an abomination, an affront to us all. If you insist on following her, I shall be forced to terminate you. Both of you! Uh, Master Trigger, I'm sorry. I have failed. You are our only hope. On the roof, the pair are fighting each other in their Reverbot forms until Geets manages to win, kicking off a boss battle. Being what amounts to a dragon airplane thing, Geets is fast and will zoom around the edge of the ship, staying out of range of your attacks before charging in. The first phase isn't too bad, and you actually get some help from the Bonds while you're fighting. After he's lost half of his health, he'll shoot them down and become more aggressive in the fight. Take out his remaining health, and Geets refuses to give up charging at Mega Man before blowing himself up. Do not forget. The Master is the only true human remaining. The system exists only to protect and serve the Master. We exist for this and only this purpose. Mega Man then has a vision or more like a flashback of his old memories. He's talking to Sarah who reminds Trigger that the Master is the only real human remaining and also to be careful in his duties and to ignore the odder things he says, also implying the Master is lonely. We then flash over to the man they call the Master, this elegant looking man in a toga with flowing blonde hair. In his interaction with Mega Man, we learn the Master has become enamored with the carbons living on Terra. It also turns out the humans on the planet aren't real humans, but artificially created by the Master and the Ancients. Despite not being the real deal, they can still get sick, grow old, and die. But the Master still admires them, feeling that they shine brightly during their brief existence, asking Mega Man if he can take him to Terra. Come on, Mega Man. If you fall asleep, you'll never wake up again. Returning to the present briefly, Yuna, now looking like her old self, is in the middle of repairing Mega Man's programming and memories, as Geets' suicide attack hurt him badly. Returning to his memories, Mega Man and the Master are now on Terra, the Master coming to the decision he wants to destroy the system on Elysium and let the Carbons live their lives on Earth. He gives Mega Man the final command to destroy the system before dying and fading away. Now back on the Sulphur Bottom, Yuna is back as Matilda, with Barrow, Blucher, and Roll in the room with her. She tells Mega Man to go where he originally arrived on Terra, and she'll get a ship prepared to take him up to Elysium. Infuriatingly, both Barrow and Roll say absolutely nothing to Yuna before she leaves, not asking her if she's really Matilda, or what happened to her in the first place. It's made more annoying because Roll says she'll continue to search for her parents, even though her mom was right there, like what the hell? Apparently Yuna either shared Mega Man's memories or just told everyone in the room what happened, as both Barrow and Blucher don't seem bothered by the fact the human race, or this version of it, were artificially created. You'd think they'd have some kind of existential crisis over it, but I guess not. Mega Man back on his feet, Roll joins them as they board the Flutter and return to Calvania Island to meet with Yuna. Yuna tells Mega Man about Roll's desperation and feelings while Mega Man was being repaired, telling him to take good care of her. Which leads back to what I was just complaining about. Did Roll really not get on Yuna's case about her using her mom's body? Sure, there's more pressing issues, but if the woman you were searching for all your life was right in front of you, you'd probably have some questions. Yuna, Gats, and Mega Man leave for space and arrive on Elysium shortly after. Here we are kiddos, the end of the game, and thankfully if you had any things you needed to do, Yuna can take you back to Terra if necessary. 
talk to her and you can find out more about Elysium and her situation with Rose's mom. She explains that Elysium is a sort of paradise built by the ancient humans thousands of years ago. Sarah and herself are androids built by the ancients and serve as mother units, basically system administrators, charged with making sure the systems on both worlds are fully functioning and that all units are behaving accordingly. She'll also finally explain why she's in Matilda's body. Turns out Yuna found Matilda on Forbidden Island, close to dying after her failed attempt to land there. Yuna tried saving Matilda using some of the nanotechnology in her own body. It worked, but she used up too much and wasn't able to use her own body anymore. So she decided to borrow Matilda's in the meantime. Though she promises once Sarah is defeated, she'll give Matilda her body back. It's insane to me this wasn't covered in the earlier cutscene with Roland Barrel. Hell, you wouldn't even know all this unless you bothered to ask her. Walk over and talk to Data and he'll fill you in on some more stuff that happened in the past. After the Master's death, Mega Man obeyed his dying wish, rebelling against his own kind and fighting to destroy the system. Yuna fought back along with the others at first, but eventually took a neutral stance when she began to understand what Mega Man was doing. Sarah didn't give up though, going to Terra and fighting Mega Man to a standstill, until both were drained and Yuna sealed both of them. Sarah was left on Forbidden Island, while Mega Man was reconfigured and turned into a baby, being left in the Nino ruins. Later on, Beryl would find Mega Man's stasis field, freeing him and Data, taking him home and adopting him as a surrogate son. Also, I didn't cover this in the first game, but Roll was the one who named Mega Man, wanting to name him after her favorite video game character. Which, like I briefly mentioned at the beginning, is super confusing timeline-wise, as classic Mega Man is both real and fictional in this game. Elysium has you going through several areas on your way to Sarah, fighting some new Reaverbot types and introducing a gravity gimmick to access some areas. At the very end of Elysium, you'll be thrown into a Mega Man series staple, the Boss Rush having to refight recolored versions of the boss Reaverbots you fought previously. There's nothing to them, so if you took the time to max out your buster and special weapon, you'll steamroll through them like nothing. At the very end, you'll run into Data one last time, and this is it boys and girls, the final battle. If you're not prepared, backtrack to the shuttle to return to Terra to grind and upgrade, because this fight is going to be brutal. I could have executed the carbon reinitialization program at any time, but I chose not to. Do you know why? Unlike you, I cannot act against the system. I can only act within the parameters it defines for me. Indeed, I cannot think of anything beyond the system's limits. That is why I cannot comprehend what could have motivated the Master to attempt to destroy the system. I am jealous of you. You were close to the Master. You understood his thoughts in a way I will never be able to. Yuna chose to remove herself from the system, even though she is, like myself, Mother Unit. I cannot do that! I've waited for you, whom the Master loved. Perhaps by defeating you, who is so sympathetic to the Master's desires, I can purge myself of these troublesome emotions. Come then, Mega Man Trigger. Show me what a first-class purifier is capable of. Dicked out in her battle armor, Sarah engages Mega Man for the final battle. She has several attacks in this phase, charging at you while covered in red energy, shooting these crystals, electric balls that'll home in on you, and a shockwave attack where she'll slam into the ground and summon several mines that will follow you and explode. On top of her arsenal of weapons, Sarah herself is very durable, eating up tons of hit from your maxed out buster and even special weapons. Because of her constant attacks, I recommend bringing a special weapon like the homing missile that you can fire while moving. Any other type of weapon will leave you an open target if you stop to attack. Gats is attempting to assist you by invading my internal systems. I do not understand. A servitor unit such as Gats should be unable to disobey the system's commands. Still, a mother unit like myself is superior to a servitor unit. His sabotage attempts are a distraction, nothing more. 
When last we struggled, you imprisoned me on Terra. Perhaps this time, it will be you who is imprisoned. Sarah's second form is an absolute monster, easily the hardest boss in the whole game, and leagues above Juno's form in the first game. You'll be transported to a place called the Mother Zone, this tiny floating platform in cyberspace or something, with Sarah attacking from afar. You'll notice that this kills the circle strafe method right off the bat, and makes dodging Sarah's attacks tough. Her attacks are worse in this form. She'll drop meteors on the platform you're standing on, create a shockwave by hitting the ground, turn into a laser beam disco ball, and worst of all, this bullshit laser attack she fires across the stage that if it hits you, will take a massive chunk of your HP off. Because of its erratic pattern and the randomness of how long Sarah will use this attack, or how often for that matter, you could end up losing in seconds if you can't manage to dodge. Ditto if she pairs it up with her gravity ball attack that slows you down. Don't be surprised if you end up getting your first of several game overs here. It's essentially a fight of endurance. Even with the best armor and your health maxed out, you'll still take a lot of damage. So if you haven't upgraded your energy canteen enough, you're guaranteed to lose. Whenever the master looked at me, I detected a sadness in his eyes. The more I obeyed the system and tried to serve the master, the sadder he seemed. Now, Trigger, thanks to you, perhaps, perhaps the master will also smile at me as he did at you. Sarah! At last, I understand. Thank you, Trigger. Th th thank you. If you manage to beat her, Sarah will finally come to understand the Master's feelings, and what Mega Man was trying to do by destroying the system. Before she can bite it though, Yuna shows up carrying her old body, telling Sarah she can't die yet, as they need her help. Elysium going offline now, the system that preceded the Ancients, the Elder System, is now activating on Terra, threatening the people who live there. Sarah agrees to help and transfers her programming to Yuna's old body. However, the trio are now stuck on Terra, as unfortunately Gats, who had merged with the ship that brought them to Elysium, died while helping Mega Man fight Sarah. Mega Man isn't worried though. He knows Roll will come through and find a way to get them all home. Keep going! <laughs> oh, that's the tenth time we've tried! Maybe we should just give up! Skipping to an undetermined amount of time later, Tron and Roll have built a rocket to send into space. But unfortunately, it blows up before it can leave the atmosphere. Their tenth failure so far, according to Teasel. Despite Data somehow making it back from space in order to help, the two stubborn girls ignore his advice and argue over how to build the ship. Sorry, Mega Man, but it looks like you might be stuck up there for a little while more. Looks like we both got a work cut out for us. Yeah, a little while longer. And with that, we've reached the end of Legends 2, and unfortunately, the end of the Legend series as a whole. So how does the sequel compare to the first game? Well, it's pretty much better in every single way. It's about twice the length of the first game, has more islands to explore, 
more enemies to fight, rebalancing the weapon system, and changing up most of the boss fights so you can't just cheese them by running in circles around each one. Story-wise, it added a lot more lore to the series, but it did it in a very clunky way in my opinion. Similar to how Juno did it at the end of the first game, characters in this game will throw out names and terms without properly explaining what any of it means. This is best highlighted with Yuna and Gats on Forbidden Island. Just talking back and forth about Sarah and Mega Man, but not really explaining what the hell they're talking about, so you end up more confused while the game gets around to explaining it much later. I know I complained about it already, but the story behind Roll's parents just feels like an afterthought. She's not very concerned about what's happened to her mom after seeing her on TV, and doesn't even have a reaction to finding out Yuna is borrowing her body. Ditto with her dad. While you can make the argument she was too dumb to put two and two together that Joe is her missing dad, she just ends up dropping the whole thing after the first visit to Kalinka. My last real critique is the underwhelming amount of side quests in this game compared to the first. From opening the art museum, helping a sick little girl, or the game shows at the TV station, there was plenty to do, incentivizing you to seek them out as they'll give you parts for the better weapons in the game. Here though, outside the optional sub ruins and the mayor's tests, the subquest may as well not exist. Things like giving the lonely girl the piggy or teaching Shu's brothers to read and write don't actually reward you with anything. Even the racing minigame in Salkata only gives you Zenny, which is already easy to farm. The newer and more unique designs for the NPCs made me think there'd be a lot more to them like the residents of Catalox, but nothing. Also, items aren't really hidden around in places like the holes and ruins, so the game has lost some of the exploration elements the first one had. But outside of that, I don't really have much else to say. While Legends 2 isn't as memorable as the first game for me, I can't deny that it's the superior game. It expanded the world, gave you more places to go, and filled in more of the story. I would say it's a nice farewell for the series, but the cliffhanger at the end, and 3 getting cancelled, really just left me craving more. But who knows, Mega Man as a series was thought dead forever, but Mega Man 11 and all the legacy collections prove Capcom hasn't given up on the Blue Bomber. So maybe one day, we'll get a proper finale to Mega Man Legends. Or at least a legacy collection. And that's the video. Thanks for watching guys. It's insane to think a year has already gone by since I first started my channel. There was a time at the beginning of the year where I was ready to just give up on it. But thankfully I haven't lost my passion for making videos and discussing some of my favorite games that I grew up with. While I don't really have a goal exactly with this channel, I want to keep it going as long as I can. Entering my second year on YouTube, I'm thinking about experimenting more with my videos, maybe review some different things, or just try different types of videos. Nothing concrete yet, but I'll see what I can come up with. Again, thanks for watching. I wasn't planning on this one being this long, but considering the game is twice the length of the original, I guess it makes sense. I'll probably be taking a break for the rest of the month as I have some ideas in terms of presenting my videos and shortening the video length for shorter games. I'll still be working through the Nuzlocke though. If you enjoyed my video, I appreciate it if you gave it a like and comment down below. Which Legends game do you prefer? Are you an optimistic fool like me and think that I'll make a comeback someday? And if you're new to the channel, I'd love it if you subscribed. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, celebrating my first year on YouTube, and I'll hopefully catch you later. Peace.